I'm going to ask you to do a couple of things. And those that are watching, would you turn your Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 2? And then hold on to that. And then what I would like for us to do right now is to ask the Holy Spirit to prepare our hearts and to really put a con conviction. And here's what I know, friends. Um, we can't leave the building remaining the same, right? Uh, we know when we know that we could go deeper, wider, and higher with God. And uh, so that's our prayer, is that the conviction of the Holy Spirit would be so powerful that we would allow him to change us completely. And so, Revelation chapter 2, and then... Uh, if you would, just go ahead and take a moment to talk to God, to prepare our hearts, your heart and mine. God Almighty, Holy Spirit, that you would prepare our hearts and minds, that we would embrace your truth and what you're about to share here through me. We had been believing you for presence, for your anointing, and for your conviction. Because if your presence will not be here, I don't want to be here. If your anointing will not be upon me, and all of those that will be serving, God, what good is it for us to do anything? So we need your anointing. And then your conviction, what good is it to come to church every single week and leave the building unchanged? We can't. Put a conviction. I pray that we would repent and that we would allow you to make this change and transformation in our hearts today, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, I want to talk to you about this first and greatest commandment that Jesus has given you and me, is to love. Love him, agape. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, about this highest form of love. And this does not come from from us, it's given by God Almighty. We don't get agape love without him giving it to us. And so I want to talk to you about this agape love that Jesus talked about. There was a man uh, attending this livestock event. And uh, there was this little girl having, uh, she's got one of these uh, grand champion lamb and uh and it was being auctioned and so the auction the bidding began and uh so when the bid reached five dollars per pound the little girl is standing next to this lamb began to cry well then the bidding continued and then it went up to ten dollars and then what she did when it went up to $10, tears began to stream down her face, and she claps her arms tightly around this lamb. And uh, so people began to think, man, this little girl really loved her lamb. Look at how she's crying, and, and we're witnessing this. And so... The higher the bid rose, the more she cried. The more she cried. So finally, a businessman who had money gave the highest bid. It was over $1,000. And then the man began to make an announcement that he's going to give this lamb back to the little girl. And so he did. Well, 
months later, the same man who witnessed all of this was part of judging some statewide essays from different schools from different girls. And so one of the essay uh, that he came across was pretty interesting. He began to read this essay, and part of the essay says this. I have a grand champion lamb who was being auctioned out. And so she began to tell the process when she began to cry when the bid went up to $5 and $10, she just collapsed and really started crying. And then a local businessman made a bid that it was over $1,000 and made an announcement that he was going to give me back my lamb. And so he was reading this. And then the girl said that I started to cry from happiness when all this took place. Well, I took the lamb home and gave it to my dad, and my daddy barbecued the lamb, and it was really delicious. People thought that she loved this lamb. I wonder though, for a moment, and those that are watching, I wonder about our love for God. When people look at you and people look at me, do they, do they wonder, man, I wonder if so-and-so love God. And sometimes we would ask, maybe we would ask the same question, I wonder how much I love God. What is my motivation, really, why I'm here? And those that are watching, what is your motivation by watching? What is it? Well, I came across this story not long ago, and it's about this donkey that the master, the owner of this donkey, had a couple of things. He had a stick with a carrot and another stick. And the story goes something like this. That the owner, the only way that he would make his donkey to follow him is to have a carrot. And so, the master or this, the, the owner would walk with a stick and this carrot on a stick. And the donkey would follow and as the donkey would follow, he would command the donkey to do something. And if the donkey does not listen, then he's got the stick to punish him. Now stay with me. Some of us think that God has a couple of items. He's got a carrot. And he's looking at you and saying, follow me because I got many blessings. Follow me, because I want to give you everything you want. And so we attend church services. We want God because of the carrot of his blessings. And then some of us are here today, and the reason being is because you don't want to get whacked by God. And so therefore, I got to go to church. I got to be with God because if not, he's going to whack me with a stick. Uh, I wonder, though, that if that is really who God is. He's got a carrot saying, follow me. Come on, follow me, because I got some good stuff for you. And so, therefore, our churches are being flooded by people that are just wanting his blessings, just wanting the carrot. And then we have people that are just here simply because they don't want to get whacked by God. What if we just follow God simply because of his unconditional love? Because he just loves you and me. In fact, there was a, a monk who made an announcement and said, Sunday night, next Sunday night, I'm going to be preaching about the love of God. 
And so the following week, Sunday night, people came, and it was dark, people came. And uh, so the altar was pretty dark. And the church had a crucifixion right in the middle. And so people came, it was dark, altar was dark, and all of a sudden, here's the monk walking towards the altar. And he began to light up the candle, and he went directly to the crucifixion. He started to light up the crown of thorns. Then he began to move the light, the candle, to light the hands to show the wound. Then he moved the candle towards his feet to show the wound. Then he took the light, the candle, and showed everybody the side to show the wound. And then he took the candle and he blew it. <sighs> and he walked away. That was enough. That's all he did to show them this incredible love, this unconditional love of God he has for them. So what's your motivation? Because he's got a carrot? Or because he's got a stick? Just can't wait to whack you with it? Are you here because maybe you are in a situation that you're so desperate? In a bad situation and you're just saying, I need God to save me, to help me with this problem. Are you here today, friends, just because you want something from him? Or, or maybe you're here today, you're saying, Pastor Angelo, I'm here because there's something in me that is telling me I need, I need God. Or are you here today because you understand his unconditional love for you, that you just want to love him? Why are you here? Why am I here? Why are you tuning in and why are you watching every week? Why? What is your motivation? What is our motivation? Friends, I want to tell you today, the carrot and the stick will never be good enough. It cannot produce unconditional love. God's unconditional love is not a bribe. It's not, you know, a threat. No. He just loves you, period. You didn't earn it. I didn't earn it. There was nothing that I could do that God, where, where God could love me. No, he gave me love. In spite of my disobedience, in spite of my sin and wickedness and my desire to really disobey him, he still loved me. And he still loves me today. His unconditional love does not change. It doesn't. What if we just love him because of his love for you? What if? No motivation, I mean, no preconceived ideas of maybe he's got a stick ready to whack me, or maybe because our motivation is because of carrot of his blessings, and that's the reason why I'm here. No, what if we just love him just because he's unconditional love, and I just want to love him because of that? Now, friends, I want to talk to you about Revelation chapter 2 real quick. Beginning from verse 1, it says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, right, this is a prophecy from Apostle John. And uh, so Jesus, these are the words of Jesus. Jesus was speaking to the churches. He said first to the church in Ephesus, he said, these are the words of him. Jesus, who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden, golden lampstand. I know your deeds. <laughs> Friends, let me just stop here for a minute. Don't ever think that God does not know what we are doing in our secret whatever place. Oh, nobody would see me. 
Friends, I was again devastated by a great leader whom I loved and whom I look up to fall into sin. <sighs> Broke my heart. Broke my heart. This leader is pretty well known. Man, God really used him mightily, incredibly anointed, anointed man of God. But he had some secrets. <sighs> Thinking that God doesn't know. God is kind of not see, see it. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. Now look at this because this is pretty amazing church. Your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Now let's just stop. That is an amazing church. Would you not agree? I mean, look at that, man. They were doing the, all the right things. I mean, they're really, wow. But then look at this. Yet I hold this against you. And by the way, this is not minor. It's pretty major. I have this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Would you say that this is pretty minor? No. This is major. When the living God, Jesus himself, the Savior, the Lord of all, would say to the church in Ephesus, yet I have this one thing against you, you have forsaken your first love. Now, the word forsaken in Greek, it simply means neglect or abandon. Can you just imagine abandoning the love that we used to have with Jesus? Imagine neglecting that. Wow. Imagine. And so here's the thing. We know, friends, that this church was pretty amazing. I mean, they were doing all the right things. Look at this. Hard work. They were persevering. They wouldn't tolerate wickedness and false teachers. They would endure hardships. They stayed the course. But I wonder, though, that if we, all of us, are doing the right things, we, you know, we, we, we have this facade that, hey, look at me, I'm doing the right things, and yet, maybe, just maybe, that we've lost our first love. But we're doing all the right things. i just, just wondering, is it possible that all of us are doing the right thing and yet have lost our first love? Well, well, how in the world could you lose your first love? Well, let's talk about that. How could you lose your first love? Well, when other things have taken over what belonged to God in the first place. When we allow other things or other people take over what belonged to God, we lose our first love. When we allow our job, when we allow money, when we allow our ministry, when we allow our family, all of this stuff. I'm not saying don't go to work or don't value your relationship with your wife and your family. I'm not saying that. But when we allow those things or those people to take over what belongs to God, then there's a possibility that you can lose your first love. Number two, when I stop valuing my relationship with them, when I stop valuing it, because really, as human beings, it's so easy to devalue our relationship with our spouse, right? I mean, we do it all the time. But when we do that to God, when we stop valuing our relationship with Him, then we have a problem. Number three, when I give Him my leftovers, when I give Him my leftover, here, I'm eating His blessings, right? Consuming it. Oh, man, this is good stuff. Oh, look at all the blessings of God. Look at, man, just the time and the energy and all this money and all these blessings of God. And then we're like, oh, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, I know. Well, God, uh, here, you can have that. That's all you get, God. I'm not going to share this pridefully. 
God forbid, but I'm going to share this with all humility and honor to God. When my wife and I made a decision to surrender our lives to Jesus, we were serious about it. When we said we're going to protect our first love, we were serious about it. Now, we were, we're not perfect. But when we fall and when we make mistakes, God is so faithful to convict us again, and we, we would respond right away. And we would say, God, we repent of our sins. How is like, man, constantly, it seems like every year we're evaluating, every time we're evaluating our love for Jesus. Our time and our energy. God, are we giving you our leftovers, even our giving? Now, I'm not going to, like I said, I don't say this with pride. I say this in humility. When we got our giving this year, or just from last year what we gave, to God and to, to help people, because we made a promise, God, that you, that you are going to use us as a conduit of your blessings, and we're just going to bless people. Because we understood that the more we give, the more we receive. And we also know that, you know, if you give, it will be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. That's Luke chapter 6. That's a promise. And so we just, it's either God is a liar or God is true. And so we said, no, God is true. And so we began to just give by faith. We could not believe that when we saw our giving, that we were the second highest givers in this church. And we look at our income, how in the world did we do that? How in the world did we give so much with what we have or what we had? We couldn't understand it. But because of what God said, you will never lack. So how do we lose our first love? If we give God our leftovers. People left and right are giving God our, their leftovers. I have been guilty of it. And then when I just keep taking from the relationship is another one. When I just keep taking from the relationship. And then when my life is no longer in alignment with his will. That's how I lose my first love. And so here's what we know. That from this study, we can have all the signs or evidence of doing things righteously and yet lose our love for God. And secondly, secondly, we all have the ability to forsake, neglect, or abandon our love for God. We all have the ability to do that. So what do we need to do? Well, number one, we got to really evaluate. Evaluating is always good. Evaluating your heart and, 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 and where you at and evaluating your life is a good thing. And then we got, as we evaluate and God, as God shows us, we got to repent. We got to come to him in humility and repent of our sins. God, man, I've always been a taker, not a giver. I've always have given you my leftovers instead of giving you my very best as you have commanded in your word. You know, God, it's... I really need to repent of my sins for allowing other things or other people to take over what belongs to you. And then we got to make a decision to come back to our first love. He, see, the problem with a lot of us is we think that God should be number one. No, God will not compete with anybody or anything. He should be above all things. So I must give everything to God. He must be a priority. And only then he could bless me, my wife. Only then he could bless me. Only then he could bless my family. Only then he could bless everything that I have in my life. Only then, if I give him my everything. And then, I got to be intentional to protect, to do whatever it takes. I got to be intentional because if I'm not intentional, all of the many things will take over what belong to God. Are you with me? I got to be intentional. And lastly, I got to be determined to stay committed. So right now, 
The reason why I'm not going to the gym is, yeah, because of COVID, but also I don't like going to gym around January, Feb. You know why? Because that place is so packed. But guess what? You go after Feb, oh, you see that it's almost empty. Why? Because people are people. And so here we are, we're pursuing God, and we're saying, oh, I want to love you, God. I want to do this, all that. And then come February, what, 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 what? didn't you just say uh, you want to grow deeper, higher, and wider with God? And so what, what's going on? Because it's got to be more than the talk. we got to stay determined and committed. Because what we're trying to do here has something to do with your eternal destination and my eternal destination. Are you with me? I cannot imagine losing my first love, facing the Savior and saying, away from me, you evildoer, I never knew you. I cannot imagine the God of the universe would say that to me because I didn't care. So if you have lost your love for God, ask God right now to rekindle your heart. Ask God to help you this year, to take you deeper, higher, and wider. That's my prayer. And so we had been pursuing God at the beginning of this year. We're really serious about it. Friends, I want to emphasize this. If God's presence is not here, I don't need to be here. I'm telling you, I don't need a pastor. I'm going to resign as a pastor. I'm gone if his presence is not here. But I know that his presence could be here. That's why I'm sticking around. Number two, if I'm just going to be up here talking because I could do that, I love to talk. But if there's no anointing, I'm going to resign. I don't need to talk. I'm, I'm serious. And then if there's no conviction, I prayed this a couple of weeks ago. I would say it in front of you, and I would say it live. Just kill me, God. Just kill me. I don't need to live. If there is no conviction, when the Holy Spirit speaks to me and convict me of my sin, and I ignore, and I just completely having, and not, not caring, just kill me. Just kill me. I don't need to live. Really, God, kill me right now. But I know that God has the power to convict. And I need to protect my heart and say, God, as you convict me, please, I'm begging you. I'm begging you. Change my heart and transform it. Purify my heart. That's the desire of my heart. That's why I'm here. That's why this is my prayer and the leadership. This is our prayer, that we would experience God's presence, that we would see his anointing, that we would see the conviction so that when we all leave, we don't remain the same. We're pursuing him, and we're wanting to go deeper, wider, and higher with him. Are you with me? That's what I have. So we're going to pray. I'm going to ask some worship team to come back up. And um, friends, I hope that you hear my heart. You don't need to belong to a religious entity. You don't. I'm begging you. You're not here for religious purposes. You're here because of our pursuit of God. This week was a tough week for me just to see our country. It broke my heart just the way we had been responding. The Christians, we always want to punch back. And Peter wrote, Humble yourself. Do good. And when he said this, Nero was in, con in control. He said, honor the king. When we know that Nero wasn't a good king. 
who was a terrible king. But he said, honor the king. But the way we had responded, it's like, man, do, do you, I mean, do you remember the snake and just when you, when you watch something about this, the venom releasing its venom? That's what we're doing with when we are on social media. We're just releasing all kinds of venom and hatred and division. And I'm angry to you. I'm going to release my venom. Dude, what happened to pray for your enemies? Do good to your enemies. What happened to when Jesus said, bless your enemies, not to curse your enemy? What happened to that? God, man, we get it all wrong, don't we? I mean, we just, we, we just get it all wrong. We do, don't we? Oh, I just, how I wish we would really allow God to transform our hearts. That we would be a light and salt. Man, I just, can you just imagine if we are just light and salt? That we would just really respond to the command of God to love with agape love? But you know what? Look at me. But I know that there's hope. There's the mercy of God, right? God is merciful. He's so forgiving. But this is the cry of my heart. And I hope that is a cry of your heart that we will no longer play religion. We would just desire God. Not having these preconceived ideas that he's ready to whack me if I don't show up to church. Or if I don't pray, if I don't read my Bible, he's ready. He's just waiting for me to make a mistake. He's going to whack me. He's just wait. He's a, a mean God. Really? Where did you get that idea? Or you know what? No, no, no. God wants to bless you, so follow the carrot. Follow the carrot. Come on, go to church. No, no, no. You got to do this. You got to do that because God has so many good things in store for you. Look. I don't think that's who God is. He just wants you. With absolutely no bribe, no threat. He just wants you to come. He just wants me to come because he loves us. That's it. He just loves you and me.